Welcome back to video 6.4. Today we're going to talk about the development of the periodic table. So starting off, there was a guy named Lavoisier, and in the 1700s he compiled a list of all the known elements at the time. So if you look at his table of simple substances, basically he had things like light, heat, dephysiologicated air, physiologicated gas, and flammable air. The metals that we still see on the periodic table, antimony, silver, arsenic, bismuth, cobalt, copper, tin, iron, manganese, mercury, molybenda, um, bedna, excuse me, medina, um, nickel, gold, platina, which is platinum, lead, tungsten, and zinc, sulfur, phosphorus, pure charcoal, and then a bunch of French things I'm not going to try to say. Um, and then the earths. And so this was their, the first time that anybody really tried to classify matter on what is now the pre not the pre-medical, the periodic table. In the 1800s, remember, there was a lot of information that started cropping up due to the Industrial Revolution and better um, investigative techniques. And so scientists needed a way to organize knowledge about elements. So there was a dude named John Newlands, and he proposed an arrangement where elements were ordered by increasing atomic mass. That's important. Newlands arrange things based on increasing atomic mass. So that's the protons plus the neutrons. And one of the things he noticed is that when the elements were arranged by increasing atomic mass, their properties were repeated every eighth element. This is called the law of octaves. Remember, an octave has eight um, music notes in it. So this is the law of octaves when it comes to, to excuse me, the periodic table. And that's called periodicity. So it increases, peri or excuse me, it, the, re the properties repeat periodically, which is why we call it the periodic table. So Newland's ordered it according to increasing atomic mass. And then there were Meyer and Mendeleev. And they both demonstrated the connection between atomic mass and the properties of different elements. So they were based off of Newland's per periodic table, and it was based on increasing atomic mass. But then there was a guy named Mosley who came in, and he rearranged the table by increasing atomic number. This resulted in a clear periodic pattern. Mendeleev and Mosley both ended up being able to predict where holes would have been and based on periodic repetition of chemical and physical properties. So we now arrange our periodic table by increasing atomic number rather than increasing atomic mass. So when you look at it, it's going to go up by one proton each time. And that is how it is arranged. Because of that, the, there is a periodic repetition, and that is called periodic law. So here is a table that kind of coalesces what they each did. And the, you'll need to know the difference in all of these guys and what they did. Um, you'll also need to know that Lavoisier had the first table of simple substances. So we've got the periodic table, excuse me. <coughs> so the modern periodic table has boxes where you've got the name, the symbol, the atomic number, and the atomic mass. If you look in your book at the periodic table that your book provides, it also gives you the state of matter. Um, that is not on the printed periodic table that I gave you. Um, so it is going to be in increasing atomic mass and it's got all this information that we've been able to use since chapter four. Columns of elements are called groups. So there are 18 groups on the periodic table. The group number is at the top of the column. Rows are called periods. There are seven periods on the periodic table and they go from left to right. So the first period only has hydrogen and helium in it. The second period has lithium, beryllium, and then you go all the way across to boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. 
Elements in groups 1 and 2 and 13 through 18, they're very, very um, widespread in what they are capable of and their properties, and they're called representative elements. Those are the tall columns. Elements in groups 3 through 12, so those are the short columns, those are called the transition metals. So we've got representative elements, we've got transition metals, and then you also have the lanthanides and the actinides that are down at the bottom. We call those inner transition metals. But I can also classify the periodic table based on metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Metals are generally shiny, they are solid at room temperature, and they are good conductors of heat and electricity. Basically, the metals are going to be on the left side of the periodic table, and they're going to be to the left of this black stair-step line that you can see. Group 1, so that's hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Those are called alkali metals. Well, excuse me, hydrogen is not an alkali metal, but they're all in group 1. And they are extremely reactive. Hydrogen is a gas. So those are my alkali metals. Everything in group 2, so beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium, those are my alkaline earth metals. The reason that batteries are called alkali batteries or alkaline batteries is because they have one of these elements in that battery, lithium batteries. So group 1, the alkali metals, group 2, the alkaline earth metals, groups 3 through 12 are the transition metals. So groups 3 through 12 are the transition metals, and then the inner transition metals are the lanthanides, which is the first row, and the actinides, which is the second row, which they are named after lanthanum and actinium. Then you get over to the nonmetals, which are found in the P block, and they are generally gases or very brittle, dull-looking solids, and they are poor conductors of heat and electricity. Group 17, they are highly reactive elements, and they are called halogens. And group 18, they are gases that are extremely unreactive. These are called noble gases or the inert gases. Helium is a noble gas, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, and enochium. They are called noble gases because the nobles did not interact with the peasants way back in the day, and they are extremely unreactive. And then you've got metalloids. So if you look at this on the screen, the metalloids are going to run along the black stair-step line. So boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, polonium, and astatine. They're going to be in the middle, they're going to have some characteristics of metals, some characteristics of nonmetals, and they're going to be your dividing line. They basically touch the stair step line, except aluminum. Aluminum is a metal. So if you look at this, this is what's in your book, and the metals are blue, the nonmetals are yellow, and the metalloids are green. And this is a pretty old picture of it. We have found um, element 117, though I am not sure of its official name. I believe element 119 has also been found, and I believe it's named after the state of Tennessee because they found it in Oak Ridge. So when we look at the periodic table, it's in a really strange shape. And the reason it's in that really strange shape is due to the orbitals, due to the sublevels. The S sublevel, the P sublevel, the D sublevel, and the F sublevel. Remember the S block? Remember the S orbital can hold two electrons. The P orbitals, there's three of them, they can hold up to six electrons. The D orbitals, there's five of them, they can hold up to ten electrons total. And the F orbitals, there are seven of them, they can hold up to 14, um, excuse me, electrons total. This is why it's shaped the way it's shaped, the periodic table. So the energy levels of an element's valence electrons, they indicate the period on which the periodic table is found. So if it's like 1s2, that's helium because it's found on the first period 
and it's where the S block ends. Also remember that the number of valence electrons for elements in groups th 13 through 18 is 10 less than their group number. So aluminum is in group 13. It has three valence electrons. Neon is in group 18. It has eight valence electrons. And remember that the S block elements are groups one and two and helium. And everything in group one is going to end S1. Everything in group two is going to end S2. If it ends S1, it's partially filled. It's not completely stable. If it ends S2, it is full and it's pretty happy. After the S orbital is filled, we then go to the P orbital. Remember the alpha principle, you fill the lowest energy level first. So groups 13 through 18, you've either got completely or partially filled P orbitals. The fuller it is, the happier it is. And then you've got the D block. The reason that it's pretty large is because remember that the D orbitals, there's five of them, they can hold up to 10. And typically you're going to fill the S orbital before you fill the D orbital. So this is why you go 4S2, then 3D, and then back to 4P. It's because you want to fill those D block orbitals. And they can hold up to 10 electrons, which is why the D block spans 10 groups in the periodic table. And then you've got the F block, and it contains the inner transition metals the lanthanides and the actinides, and it is conveniently 14 groups wide because it can hold up to 14 electrons. Thanks so much for your attention, and I will talk to you soon.